Hello and welcome to today's webinar on collective enfranchisement where I will be discussing relevant case law and case law updates. My name is Kavita Bharti and I'm a lease advisor working for the Leasehold Advisory Service. This webinar is scheduled to last about an hour with half an hour at the end set aside for any questions. We have muted everyone's phone but please feel free to send in any questions during the webinar. You can type in any questions in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen which I'll then take at the end of the webinar. This webinar attracts 1.5 CPD points. If you have any further queries following the webinar, you can email any inquiries to us. Our email address is info at lease-advice.org. Now, please take a note of the disclaimer on your screen. If you have um, very specific or detailed questions on collective enfranchisement or other matters of leasehold law, you should contact us directly for telephone or written advice. And this is our topic for the day, collective enfranchisement law, case law update, non-valuation. On this next slide, I've listed the relevant legislation that relates to collective enfranchisement for your information. Um, I know it's quite a lot of information, but at least it's there for you to refer back to. So, let's start from the beginning of the collective enfranchisement process. Um, as you may know, no subsequent notices may be given once the premises has, spe has been specified in an initial notice and that initial notice continues in force. However, this only applies if a valid notice was actually served in the first place. In Poets Chase, uh, which is up there on the screen, um, the tenants purported to serve a Section 13 notice, but it did not comply with Section 13 of Section 3 and was therefore invalid. The landlord's counter notice disputed the validity of the notice and the leaseholders were then entitled to treat the initial notice as void and were able to then serve a valid section 13 notice. Now as you may know section 13 subsection 9 prohibits the service of a further notice within 12 months of the withdrawal however this did not apply in these circumstances. Moving on to the names and addresses of qualifying tenants. Now, the full names and addresses of all the qualifying tenants must be given in the Section 13 notice, not just those participating. You also need sufficient particulars of those leases. No, sorry, sufficient particulars of those leases should also be included in order to identify them, including the date the lease was entered into, the term, and the date of the commencement of the term. Now, this information is usually provided on an individual tenant's information sheet, which would be provided with the form of legal notice. In Nat and Osman, it was decided that the failure to state the names and other prescribed details of one or more of the qualifying ten tenants renders the initial notice invalid. Now, this note decision was appealed and heard in November 2014 where the, the decision was upheld. According to the Court of Appeal, a Section 13 notice that does not contain the information required by Section 13, subsection 3E, will be invalid. As tenants are able to serve a new notice where an earlier notice was invalid, <clears throat> tenants should rarely be prejudiced by a service of an invalid notice. And this is consistent with the policy of providing certainty in relation to the existence, acquisition and transfer of any property interests. In a case which provides clarity on the scope of the power to amend initial notice and the consequences of failing to register the existence of a claim, the Court of Appeal in Regent Wealth and Wiggins allowed the appeal of three head leaseholders of flats 
in a collective enfranchisement claim under the Leasehold Reform, Housing and Urban Development Act 1993. Now, the nominee purchaser had failed to register the initial notice under section 97 of the 93 Act against their titles at the land registry. This then enabled the leaseholders to then grant new head leases to each other of their respective flats. The nominee purchaser applied successfully to the county court to amend the initial notice under paragraph 15 of Schedule 3 to the 93 Act, so as to claim the new leases as well. <clears throat> Reversing the county court judgment, the Court of Appeal held that paragraph 15 of Schedule 3 could not be used to claim an interest that had not been in existence at the date the initial notice was served, and that the lessees under the new leases were not bound by the collective claim. So just a little reminder to make sure you register that notice at the land registry. <coughs> Moving on to deducing title. So section 20 of the 93 Act enables the landlord to require the leaseholder to deduce the title of the qualifying tenant. There's no legislative guidance on how titles should be deduced. Ideally, new official copy entries should be obtained in response to any Section 20 notice. However, in Raymer Limited and Bellevue Gardens, the Court of Appeal held that the provision of OC OCs predating the relevant date by two months is sufficient to deduce title and it can be assumed that the registered proprietors will remain the same if there's no evidence to the contrary. And it would then be down to the landlord to apply for up-to-date OCEs. It was also held, on the other hand, that it is obviously preferable to obtain OCEs on or after the relevant date so that there is no doubt. If title is not deduced, then the notice is deemed as withdrawn. The next couple of slides deal with enfranchisement of houses rather than flats, and, and this is under the Leasehold Reform Act 1967. So, in this case of Henley Cohen, Henley, sorry, Henley and Cohen, tenants carried out an unlawful conversion to adapt the first floor of a commercial building to a flat. The building was part of a parade of shops, <clears throat> and although there was although there was no entrance to the flat from within the shop. The tenants sought to acquire the freehold under the enfranchisement legislation, which is the Leasehold Reform Act, as I mentioned earlier. The Court of Appeal found that a mixed-use building with both commercial and residential levels was not a house for the purpose of Section 2, Subsection 1 of the Leasehold Reform Act and was converted in breach of the lease Therefore, the tenants did not have the right to acquire the freehold. The Court of Appeals decision was made on the basis that no part of the building was designed for residential use, nor had it ever been used as such until very recently adapted by the tenants and in breach of covenant. There was no connection between the commercial ground floor premises and the flat, which were entirely separated. In the leading judgment, a view was also expressed on the breach of covenant point. The view that was, because, was, was that, because there was such a direct and close connection between the tenants' alterations and the statutory rights that they sought to acquire, they were not entitled to rely on their unauthorised conversion works to evidence their argument that the building had been adapted for living in. The tenants were seeking to obtain a direct advantage by means of their own wrongdoing and in general the law should not and did not allow this. <coughs> Excuse me. Now moving on to Jewelcraft and Pressland which is another um, house enfranchisement. 
following the decision in Henley and Cohen in 2013, this is the next case to take the question of what is a house in the context of mixed-use premises. This was a similar situation to the Henley case, whereby an, an issue arose as to whether the building was a house within the definition of Section 2, Subsection 1 of the 67 Act. It was common ground that it was designed or adopted for living in, but it was disputed that it was a house reasonably so called. The lower floor of the building was subject to a lease for use as a shop, whilst the upper floor was let as a residential accommodation. The defendants did not dispute that the building had originally been designed and constructed and had been used in part for living in, but contended that the building could not be described as a house reasonably so called as it was in June 2010. The claim was actually dismissed. Although a building consisting of a shop with a flat above could be a house reasonably so called, it would not be so in every instance, and the test had to be applied in context. Whether a building was a house reasonably so called was a mix, mixed question of fact and law in every case. And the question wasn't whether it was possible to call the building a house, but whether it was reasonable to do so. Now, having regard to the history of the claimant's property, its physical appearance and layout, the terms of the lease and the use of the premises over the years, the building in this instance could not reasonably be called a house. Now, back to collective enfranchisement under the 1993 Act. A qualifying tenant has the right to acquire the freehold to the relevant premises. In addition, qualifying tenants have the right to acquire the freehold to other property if it is a pertinent property such as a garage, outhouse, yard or garden belonging to or enjoyed with the flat or if it is property which any such tenant is entitled under the terms of the lease of his flat to use in common with the occupiers of other premises, whether those premises are contained in the relevant premises or not. Now, in respect to the second option, there's no limitation on what the other premises might comprise. And in Cutter and Pry, the upper tribunal has clarified what areas can be included in the claim, and also whether the freeholder can vary the terms of the rights offered in lieu of purchase at the tribunal hearing. Now, this appeal concerns a building known as Montague House, which was a former period office building converted into a block of six flats. Two of the flats were later joined to to become a single flat. Montague House is next to another building known as Arlington House. Both buildings form part of the same development. Pry Limited owned the freehold of both the blocks, which were registered under the same title number. Now, in May 2003, three of the tenants of the flats in Montague House sought to collectively enfranchise pursuant to Section 13 of the 93 Act. In addition to seeking the freehold of the building, they also sought to acquire the freehold of the access ways, parking spaces, and other land pertinent to Montague House. Now, as mentioned earlier, under the 93 Act, there's no limitation on what the other property might comprise. So they can include such things as communal gardens or even sports facilities. Now, however, in order to qualify, the tenants must have a right to use these areas in common with the occupiers of other premises. In this case, therefore, both the first tier tribunal and the upper tier tribunal had to consider whether the areas claimed fell within section 1, subsection 3, subsection B, where the right to acquire the freehold of the additional premises might cause problems. Section 1, 4 of the 93 Act permits the freeholder to alternative methods of satisfying the tenant's right, short of conveying the premises. In response, the freeholder then challenged the tenant's rights to acquire these areas and sought to restrict the tenant the transfer to the specified premises only. 
Now, the issue that the first tier tribunal had to decide was whether the tenants were entitled to acquire the freehold of three specific areas, namely the parking spaces, the access ways, and the other land. In the decision, they found in favour of the freeholder and concluded that the enfranchisement should be limited to the specified premises only. The tenants were granted leave to appeal on three issues. Firstly, the car parking, secondly, the garden, and finally, the issue concerning the terms offered in the counter notice in lieu of the freehold of the roadways and access ways. So, looking at the car parking situation, the tenant leases contained the following right in relation to the car parking. They had the right to park one private motor vehicle in such space forming part of the development as the landlord shall allocate from time to time. Now, when the notice was served, there were six spaces allocated to the tenants of Montague House, and four of these were allocated to the participating tenants. There were seven more spaces nearer to Arlington House that had not been claimed in the notice. In the tribunal, the landlord had argued that since six spaces were specifically allocated to each tenant, they were therefore not used in common with the occupiers of the other premises. And as a result of this, the spaces didn't fall within section 1.3b. The first tier tribunal accepted this argument. However, on appeal, the tenants argued that all of the available parking spaces in the vicinity of Montague House should be acquired by the tenants because they formed a common pool from which the spaces were allocated. They felt that the fact that the landlord could allocate spaces from time to time reflected this. And the landlord, the landlord argued that there was no common pool and that each tenant had the right to park in a specifically marked and allocated space. They felt that the concept of any allocated space was the exact opposite of property that was used in common. The upper tribunal agreed with the landlord that the parking spaces didn't fall within section 13B of the 93 Act because each allocated space was not actually used in common with the occupiers of the other premises. They also rejected the contention that there was any unfairness to the tenants. Now, Another area claimed by the tenants was a garden area that surrounded both properties and which was described as an ornamental or decorative garden. The leases contained a specific prohibition that prevented the tenants from entering upon any part of the development other than their allocated parking space and any road or pathway. Therefore, it was not possible for the tenants to enter onto or use the garden. The landlord argued simply that since it wasn't possible for the tenants to use the garden, the area could not be used in common with occupiers of the other premises. And sub subsequently, it was not an area that fell within section 13B and should be excluded from the claim. And tenants raised an interesting and particularly unusual argument relating to use. They claimed that although the garden was not used physically, it was used by the tenants visually. And they stated that in the case of this or of all, uh, sorry, they stated that in the case of this ornamental garden, there was clearly a common visual amenity for which the tenants were required to pay a service charge and as such it did fall within section 13B. The upper tribunal decided that the garden did not fall within section 13B because there was a specific prohibition in the leases which prevented the tenants making use of the gardens in the usual meaning of the word and that the lease provisions should then prevail. In their original counter notice, the landlord had rejected the claim to the roadway leading to Montague House on the basis that it was a communal access way that could not be separated from the current freehold. 
At a later date, the landlord then offered rights in lieu of the freehold in a draft transfer. The tenant claimed that the right of way had not been offered in the counter notice and that when the right had been offered, it was not adequate because it didn't contain a reasonable provision. At the hearing before the first tier tribunal, the landlord had sought to add the word reasonable to the draft wording in the transfer, which was actually accepted by the tribunal, even though the tenants argued that it was too late. The upper tribunal agreed that the rights offered were adequate and that the FTT had jurisdiction to allow an amendment to the proposed wording at the hearing pursuant to its discretion under section 92, 91, subsection 2 of the 93 Act. Now, this appeal illustrates the difficulties that, that are encountered when seeking to enfranchise large developments. Now, tenants not only have to decide whether the building is self-contained, but also what land they can acquire in addition to the specified premises. Now, this can be complicated where there's two or more buildings sharing common facilities. Now, in deciding what land can be, be acquired, it is important to ensure that either it is an area demised under the tenant's leases and used and enjoyed with the flat, or it must be an area that is used in common with occupiers of other premises. Tenants should also be aware that rights over the land may be offered by the landlord to prevent a, pr a transfer of the freehold. Whether tenants have a right to use an area or whether the area is used in common with others will always depend entirely on the wording of the leases. Um, practitioners should ensure that they check the terms of the leases carefully before deciding on what additional land can be claimed. Under section 2, subsection 3, the qualifying tenants are also entitled to acquire the interest of the tenant under any lease which demises A, any common parts of the relevant premises, or B, any additional property acquired under section 1, 2, A. In relation to A, McGuckian and 29 Eaton Place Management Company, um, it was held that a caretaker's flat was not common parts, mainly because under section 4, an area of the building cannot be both residential and common. However, in Panagopoulos and Earl Cadagan in 2010, the cooking was disputed and it was held that a flat that housed a caretaker who services the building at the relevant date constitutes a common part irrespective of whether there is an obligation under the leases to provide a caretaker to be resident. In relation to B, in Hemphurst and Doral's house, the upper tribunal held that the participating tenants could elect to acquire only parts of the lease which demised common parts under section 2.3. Now in this case, the landlord had demised itself the roof space above a block of leasehold flats on a long lease with the intention of developing the roof space into additional units at some point in the future. Now, this isn't uncommon, particularly in built up urban areas. However, it's very rarely popular with tenants because the building works and associated disruption can be very unpleasant. Now, the tenants in this case pursued a collective enfranchisement claim, which included the acquisition of part of the leasehold interest in the reef that the landlord had granted itself. The landlord resisted this claim on the basis that the tenants were obliged to acquire the entire lease it had demised and consequently had to pay a premium for all of it. The Leasehold Valuation Tribunal, as it was at the time, agreed with the landlords at first instant, but this decision was overturned by the Upper Tribunal, who allowed the tenants to acquire only those parts of the roof lease as it required. The tenants were not seeking to prevent the development. This case establishes the principle that the nominee purchaser can acquire part only 
of a lease of other parts of the building that demise common parts. And the landlords, having argued unsuccessfully that Section 2 would require the purchase of the whole of the landlord's interest under that lease. Now, something to consider is whether, in other cases, this principle could be extended to compromise proposed roof space development. Now, while compensation is payable under an enfranchisement claim, if the sale of the freehold devalues of the property owned by the landlord, it's not clear that a landlord would be compensated for the lost leasehold development opportunity. Now, moving on to resident landlords quickly. Uh, in Slammon and Planchin, the claimants were long leaseholders of two flats in the house. They sought to acquire the freehold of the house pursuant to section 22 of the Act. The defendant was a freeholder of the house. Her mother was the occupier of, of the third flat in it. Now, the defendant resisted collective enfranchisement of the house in reliance on the resident landlord exception set out in sections 4, 4 and 10 of the Act. She relied on her mother's occupation over the year prior to the claimant's notice under the Act, together with her own interest in the freehold of the house over a long period stretching back to before the time of its conversion into flats. Now, as you know, premises are excluded under the Act if there's a resident landlord and they do not contain more than four units under Section 404. Now, I've set out Section 10 as amended by the 2002 Act on this slide. I'm not going to go through it, but you can read it. I'll refer to it in the next slide. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, the Court of Appeal in Sunderland Planchin held that the resident landlord needs to have held the same interest throughout in order for the exception to apply. A freehold owner who, for the part of the period since the conversion had been carried out, held that the freehold as beneficial owner under the trust did not fall within the exclusion. Now, moving on to leasebacks. The Queenbridge case from 2014 involved a collective enfranchisement where after the terms were determined by the then Lethal Valuation Tribunal, including the terms of leasebacks of three flats, which included a service charge percentage collectively of 33.69%, the reversioner during the appeal to the upper tribunal of the LVT's decision granted long leases to the three flats to companies connected with the reversioner on terms which were different to the leasebacks that the LVT had actually determined, in particular that the collective service charge contribution of the flats were to be 8.23%, and argued that the reversioner was now not entitled to leasebacks, and there was no obligation on the reversioner to take the previously determined leasebacks, and that the terms of acquisition should be modified accordingly and the premium lowered to the figure that the LVT determined without the leasebacks. Because the grant of the new leases were not Section 19 void disposals. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the nominee purchaser argued that the upper tribunal had no jurisdiction to deal with, um, to decide upon the effect of the new leases. Because firstly, the parties had already agreed that there'd be leasebacks and section 24.1 and section 91.1 of the 93 Act only gave the appropriate tribunal jurisdiction to determine matters in dispute. And the fact that there would be leasebacks was not actually in dispute. Uh, secondly, alternatively, Section 175, subsection 4 of the Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act 2002, provides that on appeal, the Upper Tribunal can only exercise the power that was available to the LVT and the power to determine whether the leasebacks were to be granted it was not available to the LVT at the time because it had been agreed. And thirdly, an application to modify terms that had been agreed 
or determined in order to take into account a change of circumstance could only be made following a direction from the County Court under Section 24 on an application for a vesting order. The upper, tier, the upper tribunal held that it did have jurisdiction. It held that the upper tribunal has the power to consider terms of acquisition, including whether there should be leasebacks. In light of the current circumstances, the party's expectation that there would be leasebacks was not contractual, and the reversioner had a right, has a right to receive leasebacks rather than an obligation to accept them. And it would take more than a non-contractual consensus to deprive the upper tribunal of jurisdiction under section 24, subsection 1. The tribunal recognised that the participating tenants had incurred substantial expenditure arguing about the terms of the leasebacks in the LVT and that they were without a remedy in that respect. The tribunal took the view that despite that expenditure, it was not inequitable for the landlord to resile from the position in the counter notice that it sought a lease back. The judge said that the risk of such expenditure was simply a risk which the nominee purchaser and the participating tenants must take to obtain the freehold. Now, this case has wider application because it would apply equally to the situation where the landlord has not sought lease backs but, unhappy with the valuation arrived by the tribunal, grants of grants long leases of flats which were in hand. Now, moving on to one more case on leasebacks. In the Barry House case, again, it's a 2014 case, the Upper Tribunal considered whether a freeholder could require the leaseback of a unit that didn't actually exist at the relevant date with regard to a collective enfranchisement claim under the Act. The building is located opposite Kensington Gardens and consists of 11 floors with a basement and at the time of the claim, 37 flats. In 2010, the landlord started work to extend the porter's flat by incorporating part of an adjacent tank room, which was then followed in 2011 by work to form a new flat flat 1A in the entrance hall of the building. The landlord then also started work in the basement to create an office out of a storage area which was formerly used by the porters and the residents. And then the landlord later applied for further consent to build two new flats on the roof of the building. Now that application was turned down because the, but the landlord has indicated, did indicate that he would appeal. Now, the roof already had leases granted to O2 and to Orange for telecom telecommunications equipment. Not surprisingly, obviously given the intended works, the tenants then launched, launched a collective claim to acquire the freehold. The landlord continued with its works and responded with a counter notice seeking leasebacks to various parts of the building, including the new flat being created, which, the porter's flat, the basement office and the roof space. <coughs> Excuse me. In this case, it was found as a fact by the first tier tribunal that neither the new apartment nor the office accommodation in the basement was finished when the claim was served. And therefore, as a result, the landlord was not entitled to seek a lease back as the apartment or unit which is the subject of the leaseback has to be in existence and completed at the time the claim was made. Now, this decision was also upheld by the upper tribunal. The request for a leaseback of the porter's flat was also given short shrift as the lower tribunal was bound by the earlier Court of Appeals decision in Pan Panagopoulos and Earl Cadagan, which we discussed earlier. The upper tribunal agreed, saying that the porter's flat was part of the common parts and therefore part of the area being claimed in the collective claim. However, in relation to the rooftop area occupied by um, Orange and O2, the landlord was successful in claiming the lease back, even though it was acknowledged to be a common part. 
essentially the reason being that the rooftop area had stopped being the common part because leases had been granted to Orange and O2. Now this gives rise to some difficult practical issues over the repair of the roof, which will then need to be overcome. In addition, because the two telecommunication companies have each had separate facilities in part of the basement, the upper tribunal then held that the, le that the lease back could include those areas as well, the areas in the basement, because they were being used for business use. There is no. There, it was held that there was no requirement to have those areas contiguous with the rooftop, and they simply have to be within the curtilage of the building. Now, the eventual lease back of the roof will have to restrict the use to business use, but under Schedule Nine, an alternative use can be sought, subject to obtaining the landlord's consent, which may not be unreasonably withheld. And as a result, the landlords may yet be able to redevelop the roof once they obtain planning permission and vacant possession. Moving on to enfranchisement and bankruptcy. Again, this one is in relation to enfranchisement of a house as well, um, but I just thought it was important to know. So. In Hellman and John Lyons Charity, the question was asked, does the appointment of a trustee in bankruptcy in respect of a tenant's affairs start that two-year time period running again? John Lyons Charity owned a three-storey semi-detached period house in Maida Vale. Charity, Charity's freehold was subject to a lease that was acquired by Mr. James in 2002. And the lease was then subject to a mortgage and the mortgagee granted a subcharge to another bank who could appoint receivers with wide powers to give notices in the tenant's name. Mr. James was made bankrupt and a trustee in bankruptcy was appointed. The sub-mortgagee appointed receivers, following which the trustee in bankruptcy then disclaimed the lease. The receivers then served a notice on the charity in Mr. James's name claiming the freehold of the property. The bankruptcy of the tenant meant that the tenant of the house had changed and so notice had not been served on somebody who had actually been a tenant for two years. So he'd not been served by somebody who had been a tenant for two years. The lease of the house was granted for a term of nine, 99 years and Mr. James had been the tenant since 2002, so significantly more than two, thousand, than two years. But what effect did his bankruptcy have on the position? On appeal, the judge described the charity's single submission that when the trustee in bankruptcy was appointed, the lease was vested in the trustee, and so the trustee became the tenant, as simple and formidable. The trustee was not yet able to give notice under the 1967 Act because he hadn't been a tenant of the house for the last two years. In any case, the receiver's notice did not say that it was given on behalf of the trustee, but was given in the name of Mr. James, who was neither the tenant nor had been for the last two years. In this case, the notice was accordingly declared to be a nullity and the lower court decision was overturned. Moving back to um, collective enfranchisement under the 93 Act, in Howard de Walden Estates and Accordway, the Upper Tribunal decided a point of statutory construction under the Leasehold Reform Act, which had previously led to conflicting LVT decisions. It held that the freeholder, the competent landlord, was able to agree all the terms of the acquisition with the lessee of the flat, even after a notice of separate representation had been served by the intermediate lessee. The intermediate lessee's remedy was to claim a breach of statutory duty by the competent landlord, to which the latter has a defence if he acts in good faith and with reasonable care and diligence. Now, the case update you've all been waiting for, Dolphin Square and Friends Life. 
Public Services decided last year. This case involves a number of issues, but most importantly, it clarifies the company structure required on a collective claim and also what qualifies as a commercial or residential space when measuring the relative areas of the building. Now, in this case, the subject property contained 1,223 flats, and it's possibly one of the largest blocks of flats in the world. Despite this, it was still potentially enfranchisable. However, to make it so, Westbrook and a group of others, the claimants, had to create sufficient underleases to bring the property within the ambit of the 1993 Act. In doing so, they also had to take care to ensure that having put the building into a condition in which it qualified for enfranchisement, that the leases were vested, sufficient, vested in sufficiently different legal entities, bearing in mind the anti-avoidance provisions within the 1993 Act, which prevent three or more flats remaining within the same ownership. Both parties are both investment companies using the enfranchisement legislation in a way that was not perhaps first intended by Parliament to achieve a commercial objective. Now, not surprisingly, Friends Life objected to the claim that was made to the freeholder on a number of grounds. Firstly, the use of company schemes, special purpose vehicles, in the enfranchisement context. Secondly, um, was there a test for the price in the Section 13 notice? Thirdly, can the landlord bring up a new argument against the claim that was not in the landlord's counter notice? And the fourth issue was the extent of the non-residential floor areas. So, let's go through each one of those now. So, looking at special purpose vehicles as qualifying tenants. There were 612 Jersey registered companies, which each held long subleases of two flats and had voting rights in those SPVs. These leases were held by a number of SPVs created for the purpose and that these were associated companies, and as such, it was challenged that the claim would fail, as it would fall foul of the provisions of Section 5, Subsection 5 of the 93 Act. The test depended on legal rights of control and not underlying facts about the relationship. The structure that had been put in place by Westbrook was sufficiently disparate to avoid this problem, the SPVs in question had shares held by two companies, neither of which had overall control as they each held uh, exactly 50% of the voting rights. And additionally, the shares in one of the companies were held by a discretionary trust and the trustees of that were completely independent. High Court also held that there was nothing in the scheme of the 1993 Act that would stop one investor enfranchising against another. Although the Act does contain provisions to limit the right to enfranchise in certain cases involving investors, the provisions of Section 5, Subsection 5 and 6, Subsection 6 were quite narrow and it was irrelevant if these consequences were not something that Parliament had specifically intended when actually passing the legislation. Now, moving on. Oh. 
Moving on to the price in the notice. So Friends Life sought to challenge the price offered for the free for the freehold, which was 111 million, on the basis that the proposal was not a reasonable offer, following the line of authority in Cadogan and Morris in 1999. However, on the facts, the court stated that the test to be applied was not an objective test to see whether the figure in fact fell within a certain factual bandwidth, but rather that the tenant's proposal needed to be a genuine bona fide offer that was intended to be taken seriously and it needs to be within the range of reasonably justified valuations. Moving on to point three, going beyond the counter notice. Section 4 of the Act provides that there's no entitlement to enfranchise if part of the premises, other than the common parts, is occupied other than for non-residential purposes, and if the aggregate floor area of those parts exceeds 25% of the internal floor area of the premises. It is common ground that at least part of the premises is non-residential for these purposes, but there's a dispute as to how much that is. The counter notice given by Friends Life did not take the point about the proportion of non-residential occupational, but it sought to take it in this litigation. Now the claimant obviously challenged this because of an absence of reference to, to the point within the counter notice. And the court held that the landlord can take a point concerning the extent of the floor area of the building occupied for non-residential purposes even though this point was not actually raised in the counter notice at the time. Okay. Now, the fourth issue in the matter of the extent of the non-residential floor areas, the judgment sets out useful guidance on residential purposes. No. In this case, there was the argument of short-term residence being a commercial element. There were 142 flats let for periods of 89 days or less. Flats were also let for periods of 90, 90 days or more. And 17 were designated as guest rooms. It was held that it is possible to use the property for residential purposes without it being anyone's home, and no degree of permanence is necessary, as it would not be tied to a specific occupier. As such, it does not suggest the need for such accommodation to be for any fixed or minimum period. And the definition of residence indicates activities of usual living, so the usual definitions such as sleeping, eating, or living in, washing in, in its ordinary sense. The definition of common parts assumed an ordinary meaning of those words. And the common parts didn't need to be used by the whole site, but used in connection with residential occupation. So the residents didn't need to have access to them. And it was also held that even the parts used by commercial occupants, such as the laundrette, the offices, and the pool, etc., could also be classed as common parts. It was therefore held that less than 25% of the building was used for non-residential purposes. Now, the main point to note is that the scheme, which was an artificial structure, set up specifically to take advantage of the collective enfranchisement provisions of the Leasehold Reform Housing and Urban Development Act 1993, and was designed to also ensure that it complied with the letter of the legislation, did not fall foul of the wording of the Act. However, a friend's life argument was based on statutory interpretation and not 
public policy, although not all public po po policy challenges succeed. But it will be interesting, I think, in the future to see if Friends Life appeals on the latter basis. It must be likely, bearing in mind that the value and the significance of the transaction. And I do think that the outcome of any such appeal would be interesting. Now that I hope you found all of these cases interesting and useful. Um, here are some details on the screen of some future training courses and webinars that you might be interested in that Lisa are providing in the future. Um, and I will now attempt to answer some of your questions that have come through the chat box. Now, before I do so, let me just click on the survey. Um, that please note that the feedback survey is now on the screen. Feedback is really important to us, and I'd be very grateful if you could fill this in while thinking of a question, if you have one. Um, in the meantime, I'll answer the couple of questions that have come through now. Um, okay, so... The first question has come through. Um, I'm advising leaseholders about collective enfranchisement and they have fairly short leases. Is it worth serving Section 42 notices at the same time? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, it might be beneficial because the value of the date, um, value as at the date of the notices, sorry, will be frozen. And the Section 42 notice will then continue in force alongside the Section 13. So yeah, I think that would probably be a pretty good idea. Uh, second question is, can I enfranchise against the Crown? Okay, so the 1993 Act doesn't generally apply to Crown land. Um, they are exempt and it is actually dealt with within um, Section 94 of the, of the 93 Act. But the Treasury Solicitor is generally willing to deal with these matters. Um, so, you, technically no, but they, they will be willing to deal with any requests. Now, I have one more question. Uh, if I serve a Section 13 notice, Will this enable my clients to force the landlord to stop major works from this ha for, uh, to stop major works from happening? Sorry. Okay, so no is the answer. Um, the landlord's repairing obligations will continue until the property is transferred and the transaction is completed. That's not to say you can't try and negotiate with the freeholder to say. Um, you know, we are in the process of purchasing the property, would you be willing to put a hold on the major works? Uh, but bear in mind that puts the freeholder in a bit of a compromising situation as well, because it leaves him open to any action against him in respect of breach of covenant. Um, but, so, no is the answer really. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have any more questions? Just type it into your box if you have any more. You definitely know no more questions. I'll I'll wait a couple of minutes just in case anybody's typing anything in. No? Okay. Um well then I think we are finished then. Thank you very much for your attention.
and your um, questions that you did put in, send in. Um, and don't forget, if you have any further queries, please feel free to email us. Our email address is info at lease-advice.org. Um, and our contact details, our address and telephone number can be found on our website. Thank you.